Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com, and you can find our entire back catalog, as well as subscribe in your favorite podcatcher or RSS reader. I also have here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems, one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks for your time. Hey, Brock, here we are, another episode. The weather's turning nice, and that means that uh, SC deadlines are probably approaching, right? Yeah, yep, yep. So a number of SC deadlines are starting to come up very quickly here. So if you're planning on submitting something to SC, be sure to get your proposals done and get those submitted. All right, what do we got for today? So we have with us today uh, Dr. Gorgoletsky of the Stanford Reproducibility Center. So, uh, Chris, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Uh, well, thank you for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Chris Kogoleski, and uh, I'm a co-director of the Stanford Center for Reproducible Neuroscience. Um, and my goal in research and science is basically to get more neuroimaging data publicly available to, to more researchers. So uh, why is reproducibility important? Well, Basically, uh, in the business of trying to discover the nature of the universe, uh, we perform lots of studies uh, and we want to make sure that if we say something today, we can use the same data tomorrow and arrive at the same answer. It's basically the, the fundament of doing science. So in the recent past, there's been a number of high profile retractions in the neuroscience area. Was, was this, you've blogged about this a little bit and written about this at reproducibility.stanford.edu. Um, was this part of the motivation for creating this center or was the motivation before that? The motivation was before that. Uh, the, the issues highlighted in that paper were basically uh, bringing up that certain uh, analysis methods uh, are flawed and insufficient, and, and the paper itself was a little bit sensational, uh, sensationalist in nature. Uh, so the situation is not as bad as it's described, uh, but uh, but it does show that uh, it is beneficial to be able to take existing data and reanalyze it again uh, with newer methods or corrected methods, and that's where where we come in. And this is where uh, uh, the ability or to uh, uh, replicate the results uh, uh, in a formalized fashion uh, is something very useful, especially with historical existing data. So now the the most easiest one to to talk about, and I think the specific article that you're referring to, is the 15 year old bug in the fMRI algorithms for analyzing data and whatnot. How how does something like that happen, and how is it not found immediately? Uh, I mean, the, the situation was not as dire uh, as it might seem. Uh, there was a confluence of different things, and um, and the paper uh, did find some problems with a certain piece of software, but but there wasn't the explanation of of all of what was the, the major finding of that paper. But to answer your question, how things like that can happen, it's basically uh, the researcher's bias. So if you get results that confirm your theory, or if you get something that is quote unquote statistically significant, uh, you're less likely to go back and search for a problem with your analysis. Uh, however, if you don't find what you expected, uh, or your results are not statistically significant, then you go search for a bug. So if you have a bug that biases your results and gives you higher rate of false uh, uh, positive findings, fewer people question those results, and it's harder to, um, to, to find something like that. The other thing is that in uh, neuroscience, and human neuroscience, so human neuroimaging, uh, analysis is very complex and has many different stages, and this is just one of those many stages. Um, and and it's hard for a single individual uh, to to basically go through all of that code um, and, and debug it. And so I think you you half answered my my next question already is you know why exactly is this hard? You know why is reproducibility hard? And if everybody is using you know, the same tools and the same 
um, things, then everybody gets the same results, and it, it makes it difficult to realize that there's actually a problem in there, particularly when the results are what you expect. Is, is that a correct characterization? Uh, more or less, I uh, unpack what reproducibility really is uh, into two uh, things that you need to have to reproduce someone's results. You need to have the data, uh, which is the crucial and very, very important part of it. Um, and you need to have uh, their code or codes, whatever you're going to call it. And that, that second part uh, can actually get quite complex because especially in scientific uh, software, codes uh, or code is evolving very, very rapidly. We have a plethora of different versions. And there are a few papers in neuroimaging that are showing that things that we didn't expect to uh, influence the results, uh, such as, for example, the order in which you're going to link a certain binary uh, with uh, mathematical uh, libraries, can influence final results. Same with endianness of the system that you're going to run uh, your analysis on. So we have a lot of different uh, variables and a lot of different pieces of software uh, produced and delivered by different groups that uh, at the end give you the final results. So you somehow have to capture all of that to be able to uh, replicate the results. So uh, why did you um, focus on neuroscience? Well, I, I assume that's your area, but why put so much effort into reproducibility for neuroscience specifically? Uh, that's a that's a great question, and I have two takes on that question. It's like why people care about neuroscience at all, uh, and that's kind of an obvious one uh, to answer because the human brain is the greatest mystery in the world, and we all have one. Uh, and we all wonder how it works. Um, so, so it's definitely a great problem to work on uh, in general. But why trying to solve reproducibility um, in this particular domain instead of in a general way? Uh, well, we're trying with, with everything we do, we're trying to be very, very practical. Uh, we're trying to be as close to the real scientists and asking uh, real questions as possible uh, to be able to relate to their problems and their limitations. For example, we don't want to ever be perceived of coming from this um, uh, high horse and telling everyone um, that they should use this particular procedure or everyone should have 100% coverage in unit tests and every single script they write because this is unrealistic. Uh, and in the same way, uh, we want to uh, provide practical solutions in a particular domain, uh, because this way it's easier for our audience, target audience, uh, which are the scientists, to understand it and apply it to their research. So kind of in conjunction with my prior question, this is really more focused on reproducibility, not uh, a, a strict check of correctness, right? Because correctness is also incredibly important in scientific research and discovering the nature of the universe and the human brain and all these kinds of good things. But what you're trying to do is make sure that people are doing it in a reproducible way and the correctness check is a secondary but, but a different effort. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct, because correctness is an incredibly hard question. And we want, of course, we, we're doing some work trying to evaluate methods and, and trying to uh, come up with the best way to analyze data. Uh, and part of what the infrastructure we're building is, uh, is aimed at providing uh, neuroscientists with easy access to the best methods, uh, even though those might be computationally expensive or uh, difficult to deploy. Um, so in that way, we're trying to improve the quality, but you're absolutely right. If I can have a completely reproducible uh, technique, that is completely wrong. So on the center's website, you state, with the goal of harnessing high-performance computing to make mer neuroscience research more reliable. H how does high-performance computing make research more reliable? Well, basically, if uh, uh, 
if we can uh, give people access to high performance computing um, in one single place, if we treat it as a resource, like basically like water in your tub. Um, this way, we minimize the variability of, um, of, of what people are using to execute their code. Um, and it's also is treated as a carrot. Um, so in other words, uh, just remember when I said reproducibility, it comes down to access to data and access to methods uh, that were used in the original study. Um, so part of our goal is to increase access to the data uh, and we're using uh, high performance uh, computing as a sort of a carrot, as a reward for sharing your data. So our the scheme that we operate or soon will operate under um, is um, it has a very simple principle. Um, uh, you upload your data into our system. Uh, you can run all of those cutting edge methods using high performance computing. Um, and in return, after a certain grace period, that data uh, will become publicly available. Because without having access to the data, there's no way someone else will be able to uh, replicate the results. So let's talk about the data repository in a minute here, but I still want to touch on this, this secondary problem that you've identified, this very hard part of you know, I want to run the same program and get the same results, right? And assuming that I have the same data. Um, and you said something fascinating there in your last answer that you want to, you know, provide access to tools and potentially even have a single service where people are running all their stuff so that uh, I, I think one of the implications is that you can have apples to apples kind of comparisons of results. But how do you account for even the drift of technology over time? So assuming that like you get all neuroscientists in the world to run on this particular HPC cluster, well, that cluster is going to last, say, two to three years, and then they're, then they're going to upgrade it with the next generation of technology, whether that's the next uh, processor chips or the next generation of numerical simulation libraries or whatever that therefore may give slightly different results uh, even with the same programs and the same data. How do we wrap our brains around that? <laughs> no, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Uh, well, uh, it's, it's, it's a great question and it, it sort of points at the fact that sometimes we don't want reproducibility because we have improvements. It's again back to the uh, to the all, it's reproducible, but it's wrong. It's reproducible, but it's imperfect. It's reproducible, but it's suboptimal. Um, so obviously, uh, if you want to do apples to apples and keep on the bleeding edge, uh, you have to rerun the same analysis uh, with new versions of software again and again. Um, and we, we also, just to kind of a side note, we are simplifying our problem just to the software layer, uh, or, or actually just to the software layer above the kernel. Um, so we do assume, and I know this assumption is not 100% correct, um, that across different architectures and across different hardware, uh, we're going to get the same results. Uh, because if we were to like uh, actually guarantee the same hardware, uh, that would be just too much to tackle, but software is plenty. Um, so we've got our hands uh, full. So uh, what tools have you created for the neuroscience community to encourage this, uh, this method of operation? Uh, so, so I can kind of describe this ecosystem from uh, kind of top down. Uh, so our vision, as I said, is, is provide science as a service in exchange for making your data publicly available. And that service, uh, which uh, hopefully we will launch in publicly uh, this summer, uh, allows you to uh, upload your data, uh, edit it online, and uh, the first step for reproducibility is being able to take um, snapshots, immutable snapshots of your data. Um, and because to be able to go from results uh, 
true uh, methods uh, to the data. You have to know in what state this data was, and and data set change people what subjects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we have this science as a service platform, but we have to populate it first with data. Uh, so to be able to 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 do that efficiently, and this is why we um, we uh, doing this within neuroimaging. Uh, we had to come up with uh, with widely acknowledged standard for describing and annotating neuroimaging data sets. Um, so someone from a lab in Texas could upload the data set and our tools would understand it. And someone from Helsinki would also upload a different data set and our tools would also understand it. Uh, so we developed a standard that's called uh, BITS. Uh, or, or brain imaging data structure, and that allows us to interface um, between the data and the computational methods. And then we started populating the service with, uh, with tools, with basically those logs that people would run on their data. And to make this uh, widely used and um, appealing to people, again, we had to have the best methods across the field, and it's a heterogeneous field. It's not uh, that uh, you're going to ask uh, every scientist and they go, are going to point to this particular software package and say, like, this is what I want to use, and this is the only one. Uh, no, there are multiple competing packages. There are multiple ways of analyzing this data. So again, we reached out to the community, uh, and we had this uh, workshop last year where we brought the um, the leaders of uh, uh, methodological development in neuroimaging, and we asked them to take their existing tools, put them into software containers, and make them work with our uh, input data format. Uh, having those tools, now we can, uh, much easy, in a much easier way, put them on our platform uh, and make all of this uh, available uh, to everyone. Uh, and on top of that, we're also building some of our own tools. Uh, actually, we call those tools bids apps uh, because everyone, everything needs to be an app these days, I, I hear. Um, so uh, we are building some of our own bids apps in lab, uh, trying to, to make them as robust as, as possible. So this is different than the usual data management plan requirement of, you know, keep all your data, keep all your code, zip it up somewhere and tell people where they can get it. This You're going a little bit more in depth in terms of trying to get people to do it in the same framework so that you can run it and other people can run it. And like you said, your tools would understand people from different parts of the field at the same time. Is that a safest, you know, difference between the other attempts at increasing reproducibility and data reuse? Uh, uh, yeah, we, we trying to, to have this carrot rather than stick approach. Uh, people want to do science uh, in the best way they can. It's not that scientists are evil and all of their, them are I'm just trying to p-hack everything away. Uh, it's just the tools are missing. And we are trying to build those tools and we're trying to make those things easier. Uh, and here the carrot is, is processing and access to cutting edge methods. So basically if someone um, has uh, the, doesn't have the resources to run this very computationally expensive method that is um, hard to install and, and maintain, uh, and they have this option of just uploading the data to our servers and we're going to run this analysis for them, it's a no-brainer. Uh, they're going to do it because they benefit uh, from it. Um, and we take care of all of the reproducibility. The data is snapshotted. Uh, the method itself is in a container, and all of the containers are strongly versioned. So you can always go back to that particular version that generated this result and to that particular version of the data itself. Um, so we attract people by the, the methods they care about, but we provide this reproducibility uh, for free for them. Can you give us a little more details on this? Like, what kind of platforms are you going to allow people to run on? And, you know, how much storage are you going to provide? And, and, you know, where are you getting the funding for this kind of stuff, too? <laughs> uh, 
Yes, so that, that's, a, that's a great question. So, so this kind of research uh, is, it, in general, is not that easy to, to get funding for this sort of, uh, uh, we want to make science better uh, research uh, from typical sources. But we were very happy to, to receive a generous grant from uh, Laura and John Arnold's foundation. Uh, and this is what is funding this uh, right now. And this is mostly the development stage where we're building all of the infrastructure, all of the software around it. Uh, but the idea is that um, the architecture of the system will allow us to tap into existing publicly available high performance resources. Um, so basically there are, there are plenty of programs where uh, you can apply to get an allocation, for example, on Exceed. Um, uh, or on TAC, uh, where you can basically get uh, uh, free cycles on a cluster. Uh, and this is how we plan to maintain this project in the future, basically paying for the compute. And most of the money right now goes into development of the infrastructure and the software. Um, storage will be a, a, a bit of a concern in the future. Uh, we haven't quite addressed the kind of intermediate storage. Uh, but we have some um, uh, interesting conversations uh, with companies such as Amazon um, for providing uh, free unlimited storage for publicly available uh, data sets. And what is the, so all of this kind of leads to, you know, the, I, I'm a researcher, I, I have a whole truckload of data and I don't have resources to, do the computation on, um, or, or maybe I do have the resources to, to compute it. What would inspire me then to, you know, put this system, put all this data and whatnot into your system? Oh, well, I mean, if you, if you don't have the resources, then, then the resources would inspire you. Uh, but if you do have the resources, uh, it's a little bit like having an external backup and a little bit of having a, a nice environment to do and track your computations. Uh, so uh, I do hope that people who do have access to the computational resources uh, might still opt to use this service uh, because we're going to provide this data management layer for them. Um, and otherwise, maybe they just like us and that's where they're going to do it. Is there any fear? that uh, there will be more takers than givers? Like if the data is freely accessible, um, are, is there any fear that that will inspire some uh, greedy actors to just take all that free data but not contribute any of their own? Uh, I see that as a benefit. We love takers. We love uh, those, how do you call them? Uh, scientific uh, data parasites. Yes, uh, we absolutely adore data parasites uh, and people who take freely available data and reuse them. This is why we're doing this, um, because if they reuse the publicly available data, that means that more science is happening for less money. Um, and this is a great uh, saving. Um, we recently estimated that the data shared uh, through the previous generation of this platform called OpenFMRI uh, saved uh, something around the ballpark of $3 million. Uh, if, if that data were to be acquired de novo, um, and this is how much it would cost, that people just took existing data and did new science on it. Um, so we, we are not concerned about having more people download data than people contributing data. So you mentioned Open MRI. Um, what is Open MRI? Uh, so Open MRI is the uh, the first truly public uh, uh, database uh, for for task based fMRI, and later it evolved into any MRI. Uh, and this is the form it is in right now. Um, it's a it's a very simple uh, repository. Mm -hmm. Uh, for storing human uh, neuroimaging data. And one of the, the things that uh, the way it stands out from other repositories, that's completely public. 
so everything is public domain that is deposited in this uh, in this repository. So there are no barriers or no hoops that you have to jump over to um, to be able to access the data. Uh, and that's what makes us stand out. Uh, and we've been doing this for a good few years and and building uh, and collaborations with, with journals and associations. Um, so it's also a, a respectable place to deposit your data. And we're seeing more push both from journals as well as um, funding bodies to deposit data into uh, domain specific repositories. So have you seen a shift in culture towards using, not necessarily your environment specifically, but towards using environments like what you've proposed? Uh, so, I, so I see the shift in sharing data. Uh, I don't quite see much of a shift in terms of um, using science as a service platforms yet. Uh, although I hope it will come there. Like we see it is on a smaller scale. We see smaller services that require less data and less computational power, but they just provide it as a web application. So instead of having to download software, you go to a website and then we upload a few megabytes of data and you get some fun result. Uh, or maybe you do some simulation um, on a website. A colleague uh, uh, working in the center as well, uh, Joke Durnes, she developed uh, a wonderful app for optimizing the design of an experiment and, and that's all running on the web. So it's not as computationally expensive as the analysis that we're planning, but it shows that lowering the barrier of access through providing web interfaces is attractive for scientists. So do you have plans to move into other areas of science, either further more parts of neuroscience or new domains? We, we're probably going to stay focused on, on human neuroscience, but that doesn't mean that uh, we are at any uh, level close to exhausting uh, its breath. It's, it's a huge yield. And um, right now we are branching out from MRI to other ways of acquiring brain-related data, such as MEG or PET. Uh, so we're trying to combine these different modalities, but uh, we're probably going to stick to the existing uh, solutions. But uh, everything that we are learning here, uh, uh, we are very happy to to convey those lessons, uh, and and hopefully other fields could also learn from it the same way we learn from other fields, especially from genomics. Uh, and we have planned some uh, integrations with more broader open science frameworks, um, such as the open science framework, um, which are not neuroscience specific. Now, jumping back just a little bit here, in terms of uh, having you know giant repositories of scientific data uh, available, particularly as this data you know accrues over time, does that actually make it more cool or or improve the culture of reproducibility itself because this wealth of data and then if you're bolting on the second part too like oh well the code that was used to analyze it is also freely available too does that just you know is is the hope that the, the barrier to entry to reproducibility becomes significantly less and therefore inspires more people to do that uh, yes, that is definitely uh, the hope and the goal, and we already see that. So I can give you an example. There, there are a lot of uh, methodological development. So basically, someone proposes a new way of denoising data, or normalizing data, or or analyzing data. Um, it's going to serve a purpose to answer a particular cognitive or neuroscientific question. But first, you have to validate the method, and you have to test the method. And that's in itself the scientific result. And without having access to open data, uh, you could publish a paper showing, oh, I validated this method by running uh, this analysis on this data. 
but no one would be able to actually replicate it on the same data because they will not have access to that data. So if they try to replicate it on a different data and they get a different result, they don't know whether it's the data or the method. Um, and I'm not saying that replication um, um, on separate newly acquired data uh, is bad. It's very valuable as well. But having access to benchmark data sets uh, is crucial for uh, methodological developments. Now, going hand in hand with that, if you have access to open data, are, are you also developing these tools and the numerical analysis and computational uh, aspects of this in an open source kind of way? Oh yeah, like uh, we do everything in open source way, uh, and it and it's wonderful. It's basically like joining this very big family of of developers and hackers. Um, especially now in the age of GitHub, uh, it's it's just wonderful to see people collaborating uh, on new features and new faces uh, coming up almost every week uh, on the bigger projects. So so all of this is open source, uh, and it's not just open source in a way that, oh, here's the source, you can have a look at it. Uh, but it's basically open source in the sense that we have an open community of contributors and we are open to new contributions and we, we perform the, the coding in an open way. Even, even when I would uh, make a comment or have a comment on, on a line of code written by someone in the same office, I would still convey that in an open way through GitHub because our goal is to build a community and work in this transparent way. So what uh, license do you make the, the code available under? And is this is perhaps a slightly naive question. Is the data available under the same license or a similar license? Uh, uh, the license we use for code is usually Apache 2.0 uh, because we are open to uh, both open source as well as commercial applications, uh, whatever you know, pushes the science forward. Uh, but software licenses uh, uh, do not have the right uh, legalese uh, to be uh, uh, applicable to data. And in terms of data, we're following the lead of, um, of other institutions and journals, such as CERN or Nature, uh, and uh, applying the public domain license. So the either PDL uh, or CC0. And that basically gives you the right to do whatever you want with the data. Uh, so you can use it for commercial purposes uh, as well. So Chris, uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, we didn't get into a lot of the detail of how your software as a service for a reproducible neuroscience actually works as a technical contraption. Um, but uh, where can people find out more about the Stanford Reproducibility Center? Uh, so you can go to our website of disability.stanford.edu, uh, which is a you know high level description of what's going. Very pretty images, uh, or you can just dive into the code and find us on GitHub. We are under the organization Paul Drug Lab, uh, and that's where most of the things are. All of the neuroimaging apps are available under uh, the organization Bits Apps. Uh, and you can always uh, shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer all questions. And if you're doing something similar uh, or you have some comments, how can we be more efficient or better in what we're doing, I would love to hear them. Okay, Chris, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thanks for your time. This was great. Thank you for having me.